I'm recording. Am I recording? I'm recording. Hello. Hello. <laughs> that was a great intro, Steve. Thanks. Yeah. So, nice um, yeah. Welcome back, everybody, to webinar number 11. Um, this one's on recalibrating reality. Yeah. And first, there's so many, I'm seeing so many great names in the audience here. Uh, and one of them is, I think, it's Borjana. And I think, Borjana, you're in this. There's a picture of you in this. I'm pretty <laughs> sure. I'm pretty sure. I actually, I'm positive. So that's kind of exciting. Like, you know, you're, you're one of our examples. Exactly. Um, so people are still joining. Um, while they're joining, maybe we could uh, uh, talk about what we're going to do today and then the, uh, the, where they can get this stuff afterwards. Yeah. If, you're, if you're registered, you'll get an email afterwards that has an archived version of this video. So if you like, lose your connection or something, uh, don't worry about it. We'll also archive it on the site. And feel uh, free to, feel free to um, if you did see it, um, feel free to send the link to someone else who you think might enjoy it. Yes. Yeah. So um, there's also on the right channel thing, there's a way that you can ask questions and uh, chat with us and stuff. Um, we have uh, our secrets behind the scenes, Rebecca Bray. She'll be helping us answer those questions and, and, and relaying them to us. Um, but what, oh yeah, and then the other thing, today's webinar is rated PG-13. Oh yeah. Um, so we're going to show artworks and images that, uh, of war that include death and dead bodies. So just to let you know, if you've got, you know, if you're, it's not like squeam. Well, maybe if you're a little squeamish, uh, it might be a little rough. We'll, see. we'll let you know it's coming up. Yeah, it's not too bad, but it, it is there. So uh, today we're going to talk about art. Yeah, this is it. This is it. And I, I'm super excited. I think Steve, you know, who went to art school is probably less excited. Yeah. Uh, or... <laughs> uh, but we're, we're going to talk about art not as an abstraction, but art and how, as artistic activists, we can learn from art theory. Uh, so this is going to save you from going to those big lecture halls where there's like 300 people and they just put slide after slide after slide after slide. We've done that. Um, and uh, so we're not going to make you do that. But we're going to do a real focus, sort of deep dive on how we can make how we can learn from art and how we can learn from aesthetic theory and apply that to some of our practice as artistic activists. So you ready to go, Steve? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Yeah. So this is, I, uh, you gave me a color picture. I made it black and white to make it oh. seem more gloomy and depressing. <laughs> what is this? Where is it? I'm not seeing it, Steve. Oh, you're not? No. You're not seeing the museum? I'm not seeing the museum. How about now? Now I'm just seeing you. Oh, there we go. Okay, yes. So look, when we, when we, when we hear art, the word art, this is often what we think of. Um, and, you know, big repositories of art. This is the Smithsonian, I think. Um, and, you know, you walk through the doors of the Smithsonian and you see things like this. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> You see things like this, exactly. Like basically pictures of rich dudes, this guy being Hans Holber, uh, Henry VIII. Um, and what's next, Steve? We got, or we can get pictures of this, which is a little later in time, which is the proper bourgeois, a man, his wife, a gun, and his property. Is it Thomas no, Gainesville? It's just, it's just a man and his property. Let's yeah, be exactly. <laughs> That's, let's just yeah, call it as it is. Um, or perhaps pictures like this, glorified scenes of history. This is the um, introduction of Europeans, the arrival of Jan von Reibach, founder of Cape Town um, and early settler in uh, South Africa. And you can see how grateful the local indigenous South Africans were to have this white dude come to, his come to their land. Um, and finally, we see pictures like this, 
which is a picture of war, um, but it's not really war, it's Napoleon on his great white horse. Um, and that's kind of, you know, what art throughout history has been, is usually the way that those people who can afford artists would like to see the world. Um, yeah, and you know, fortunately this is, this is what was done in history and we've moved past this. We don't, we don't do this kind of thing anymore. <laughs> Art no longer has to represent power and, and wealth and the status quo. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Nice to see things have changed. We're but fighting. That's not all art can do, Steve, right? No. But also, exactly. Because, you know, art is also something that those without power can use to express their own ways of seeing the world and, very importantly, ways of seeing the world which are outside the norm of power. And a person who we've been heavily influenced by in thinking this through is the great poet Audre Lorde. Um, there's Audre Lorde. And um, she wrote an essay called Poetry is Not a Luxury, which we uh, encourage you to read. You can actually get a PDF of it up on our site under our reading list. But in that article, what she does is she lays out that what poetry and, by extension, all art have allowed her to do is – go to the next slide, Steve. Mm -hmm. is help give name to the nameless so it can be thought. And she talks about the fact of that growing up as poor, black, and lesbian in a white supremacist, patriarchal-dominated society, that she had a difficulty even being able to express what she felt because all of the dominant discourse around her was that which was written through a history of white men. But it was art that allowed her to take her experiences and give them name, give them some sort of tangible uh, tangibility that would allow her to even think about it for herself. Okay, um, and a good example of this we always think of is uh, Georgie O'Keeffe, um, and how that what art allowed her to do was allowed to look into nature and see female anatomy. Um, George O'Keefe's doing this in the 1950s. It's incredibly radical at that time. Um, it's still radical today. But the idea that art was something which opened up a world of communication between what she felt, what she saw in the world, and the rest of us. Art can also do other stuff as well. Um, this is back to Audre Lorde, which she says, I could name at least ten ideas I would have once found intolerable or incomprehensible and even frightening, except as they came after dreams and poems. And again, this is this idea that what art can do is it can speak in a language outside the dominant discourse. And that it allows us entry into worlds and the ability to communicate our visions of those worlds to other people. So, for example, what you can think about is like how does art actually work politically? And we're going to start with this, probably the most famous piece of art ever. Um, and this is Pablo Picasso's Guernica. Um, give a little background on it. Guernica was painted by Picasso in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War. Um, it was commissioned by the left-wing Republican government of Spain, who hoped that the graphic images of the civilian bombing of the Basque town of Guernica by the fascists, when it was going to be displayed at the World's Fair that year, would persuade the people and the rulers of the world to come to the aid of democratic government of Spain. It also didn't hurt that Picasso was a star at that time, um, but what they wanted to do was get people to look at this, okay? And they basically said, look, we're getting bombed out of existence by these fascist warplanes. The other powers have put, a, except for Russia, have put a blockade on us, so we can't receive arms. We need to essentially guilt trip the Western powers, show them the horror which is war, so they'll lift that blockade. And so Guernica, um, was an attempt to actually portray that horror that we just saw in that image that Steve put up there in artistic form in order to show reality, make the invisible visible. Um, and this is something that could be called the mimetic function of art. Steve, you're really good at this slide thing. I gotta, I'm just going to hand it out to you right there. You're pretty good at intuiting where I'm going with this. Okay. Uh, in the mimetic function, mimetic comes from the Greek word mimesis, which essentially means to imitate um, or to hold a mirror up to reality. 
And so one of the functions we can think of from looking at political art is that what art can do is it can hold up a mirror to reality. It can show a reality that otherwise wouldn't be seen. Or it can show reality and put it into context, things like a World's Fair, a gallery, or on the street, and where in which people wouldn't expect that reality. It can make people see things. Now, going back to some of those examples we saw, that the mimetic is exactly what's at, at operation here when you get a picture of this rich white dude, okay? Because he's basically saying, look at how great I am, look at how powerful I am, look at all this stuff that I have, I am a king. Look at me, okay? But it can also be used to glorify other subjects, okay? And this is a, a, an artist that's out of South Africa, um, Zaneli Mahuli. And what she did is she did a whole series on the South African trans community, basically holding a mirror up to a community which most people don't know about, don't want to look at, and giving them dignity, and giving them actually presence in places like art galleries. Um, or, for example, if you go to the next slide, Steve, yes, this is holding up a mirror to a particular way of looking at colonial con conquest, but there's other ways to look at colonial conquest as well. So, for example, here's Diego Rivera, um, who's actually using the mimetic function of art to make a comment on the brutality of conquest. This is from the History of Mexico, 1831 series that's painted on the walls of the National Palace in Mexico City. And this is about European conquest of the Americas, but it's a very different picture than, say, that idea of European conquest that we saw of South Africa. In this case, we see conquest for what it is, which is slavery and brutality and so on. It's reality, and what Diego Rivera is doing is holding up a mirror to it, so we're forced to look at it. Similarly, we can look at nature as property, um, women as property, and dogs as property. But we can also, going back to George O'Keefe, don't forget the guns. Oh, the guns! Yeah, he's got a gun because he's got to, he's got to protect his cop property. I like that Steve, your just boys came from no place for that, but thank you. Um, and this is back to George O'Keefe, who actually is looking at nature and having a new perspective to valorize women and women's anatomy, okay? Both are holding a mirror up to nature, but seeing two very different perspectives. And finally, to look at war, it can be, you know, glorious pictures of Napoleon on his white horse, but it can also be Francisco Goya. Francisco Goya. <laughs> Francisco Goya holding up a mirror to reflect the horror of war, um, showing us images that people would not look at. And this was from a series he did on war in which he showed war as innocent civilians in front of a firing squad of women being raped of the brutality of war. And here we're going to have our little turn away moment. Um, this is a strategy also used by um, Art Workers, was it Art Workers Coalition? Art Workers Coalition. I think this is one of the most powerful like uh, images from the Vietnam War of, of uh, uh, the cost of war, right? So the quote here, question and babies, answer and babies, um, is from uh, a congressional hearing, right, about the yeah. My Lai Massacre. And so what the Art Workers Coalition did is just took an image of it and laid the soldier's testimony over it. Um, and there, it took a long time that I could look at this and not be like moved to tears. Yeah. Um, I've seen it enough now that it doesn't happen anymore, but it, it was like more than any other image. It's just very powerful. Yeah. And so, again, it's, you know, go on, please, Steve. Well, I was just going to say all these examples are. You know, it kind of reminds me of like artist journalism or something. Like there's different perspectives, but it's it's sort of the truth telling, right? This is this is the world as it is. And one of the things we wanted to talk about is how this plays out in action. Like not art examples, but activism examples. And the best example of this I think is probably something I we I think we've talked about this in the webinars before, but uh the the Southern leadership uh Southern so, Christian yeah. Thank you. Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, campaign in Birmingham, um, where 
now I don't remember if we've talked about this before. No, we, we it, did. We did. Yeah, okay. So it was a planned uh, action where they knew they would get something like this reaction. And the reaction and the images of it were meant to show the brutality of, uh, of segregation in images. And so, it, again, it is a reflection of the world as it is, are showing this thing that maybe would only happen with when cameras weren't around in front of cameras. But it's still, as you say, like putting a mirror up to reality, right? To make, the, make what is normally invisible visible. Yeah. So let's go back to Guernica, though. Yeah, yeah, because we kind, of, <laughs> we kind of moved through that really fast, OK? Yeah. So, <laughs> but what I found about, about this Guernica. picture is it's like so big, and it's meant to be so impressive. Uh, to make an impression on the on the people attending. Uh, it was the fair, right? World's Fair. Yeah, it was the World Fair. Yeah, but the, yeah. this image of the reality of it is is brutal. Why not just make a giant image of this, right? What do you? Why do you need to have a painting when you have these images? Yeah. Right. Well, what do you think, Steve? I mean, and also, why not just paint it like it is, right? Yeah, yeah, you could do a realist painting of something like this, and it yeah, still gets I mean, people to pay attention and to look at it. Yeah, I mean, it looks really, I mean, it's, it's, it's why represent it this way? And so, actually, we're going to open that up to uh, folks out there in webinar land. Um, why would Picasso, particularly he's charged by the Spanish Republican government to open people's eyes to the bombing of Guernica? So why does he do this weird cubist thing, if you could put that up again? Uh, why that? Like, what was he going for in doing that? The thing I wonder about sometimes is, how is this better than this? Yeah, exactly. You know? Or and I think there's answers, right? But when the, the reality itself is so brutal, you know? Oh, OK, so we got a great. Great um, comment from Leslie, because people wouldn't relate to these people. An abstract version could represent anyone. Fantastic. Uh, Good. What else? Yeah, yeah. So in a way, it's more relatable. I don't know if I've ever heard that one before. No, that's a good one. Yeah. Because you can put yourself into this, right? Um, Lane, I'm not sure it's better, but it mythologizes and universalizes. I like that. And there are, there's a lot of mythic elements in there. That bowl off to the left. Right? That's a symbol of Spain. That anybody from Spain would have understood and the sort of that tragedy of a bull being in the middle of this bombing. Um, but why does the bull have two eyes and it's sideways and uh, I mean, huh? Like, what's that about? Well, yeah, the, that's not what a bull actually looks like. So Gonzalo and... writes, he can amplify specific elements. Good. And so like, he can actually if you see those dead bodies, they're dead. But this is the moment when the bomb hits. This is the destruction. This is the. It translates from a visual plane into a field of energy, right? Like that, it really just pops that sense of horror, the sense of confusion, the sense of feeling. Great. What else are we seeing? Um, well, the, to me, there, there's the that this isn't. This isn't what it actually looks like, right? Yeah. That it's like, it's, I don't want to say distortion, but it's a, uh, uh, well, abstraction, I think, is what Leslie yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's actually a, a good way of thinking about it, right? Yeah. And I think the fact is, is that, you know, you know, we still, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of interpretations coming up on the chat right now, and I think right. that's part of it too. Which is, when we look at the picture, we've got one meaning. But this has a multiplicity of meanings built into it, right? Almost like at a, at a visual level, too, which is like part of that whole cubist experiment was to be able to show multiple perspectives at the same time. Why the bull looks so funny is because you're seeing it from the front and the side simultaneously, right? Um, and if you think about this, right, he's creating this as a defense of a democratic republican Spain. And if you think about what the ideology of democracy is about, it's about the multiplicity of perspectives, right? 
It's about a universalizing of an ideal. Now, counter that with fascism, right? Fascism is about one way of seeing things, one perspective, one truth, and that's all there is, and that is the truth of the leader. And everybody else is supposed to fall in line with that, right? Everything else is fake news. Everything else is fake news, exactly. <laughs> um, and what this does is it just immediately provokes what's going on. I think this, you think that. Why are we seeing the side and the front, the multiplicity of perspectives? And so one of the things that Steve and I like to think about with this, and we've talked to a lot of folks, and we get new ideas here, but other ideas there. Um, in the past, when we have asked these questions, is that what Picasso is doing is, regardless of what the content is, within the form itself, he's trying to get us to look at reality differently. Instead of holding a mirror up to reality, He's saying we need to comprehend reality from a completely different perspective, or in this case, a multiplicity of perspectives. Does that All make right. sense, Steve? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot and, of sense. Okay, and so, and so, um, this is something. Uh, this this guy we found very useful. You're getting a nice picture of him later, uh, called Jacques Ranciere. I know I pronounced it wrong, but hey, I never took French. I took Spanish. Um, and has called the aesthetic. Okay, he says that there's a medic function of art, which is about mirroring reality, but then there's an aesthetic function of art, which causes us to think differently about the very way we make sense of reality. Right? Say that again. Oh, Jesus! I don't know if I can. You do it, and maybe maybe it'll come out clear. So, all right. So there's the mimetic, which is like, let me show you the real truth. Let me show you yeah. what's actually happening. And then the aesthetic is about changing what we think reality is. Boom. Is that it? That's it. That's good. All right. well, uh, let's look so, at an example, right? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is a standard of avant-garde. And this is probably one of my all-time favorite paintings. Here it is. Here it is. Oh, it's already there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and by the way, this is the painting. Right. <laughs> uh, this is Kazimir Malevich's Black Square. Okay, Kazimir Malevich uh, painted it in 1915. He's a Russian avant-gardist, full supporter of the revolution that is underway in Russia at this moment. And this is his statement in support of the revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the big question here is, like, how is this political? Like, for him, this is a deeply political painting, right? But how yeah, is I it guess. I gotta guess. Okay. Well. All of you can write in too, like how do you think this is political? Here's my here it is. Okay. Isn't it? It's a black flag. No? No, I mean it could be, but what, what does that mean? <laughs> well is he an anarchist? No, right? He's a communist. Uh, he's a communist. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so it should be red it should be red. Yeah, well, okay. So what do people out there in webinar land think? I see Chris Phillips just came on. Give it to us, Chris. What is this about? How is it political? Let's see. Oh, so ah, Stephanie. Stephanie, boom. It's refusing imagery. Nice. And one of the things I, I left out of this is that the, when Malevich painted this, it went in the upper corner of his studio. You can't see that, but it's up there, okay? Um, which is where traditionally in a Russian household you put a portrait of a saint, right? And so the imagery, the dominant imagery of that time, which supported the church, it supported obedience, it supported power, was to have a saint. And so by refusing that image, he's basically doing a big fuck you to the Russian Orthodox Church and by extension the Tsarist um, uh, regime. It's sort of like Pussy Riot showing up in a cathedral and saying fuck you to Putin. The absence, Brian says, the absence of visual image stimulates the deep despair of living under the rule of Russia. I like that too. Which is this sort of sense of nothingness. Good. Vreer. Ah, Vreer. Vreer. Hello, Vreer. Hey. <laughs> I guess it's more about a completely different way of showing artistic interpretation in the world. Not a black flag. Boom. There you go, Steve. I want to stay with that for a second. 
a completely different way of showing the artistic interpretation of the world. Think about what a revolution is. It's a radical departure from what we know it to be. Think about what this is. It's a radical departure of what art is supposed to be like. And just as the revolution is going to create this sort of blank slate, one of the things that Malevich is saying is, you can read into this what you want. The meaning it's going to have is up to us. And that we are going to have to reimagine what an economy is, what a society is, how to order ourselves, just as if we're going to have to reimagine art. So he's like painting the blank slate or painting the void that this new culture is going to be formed in. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I think that's, that, 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 was, some, that was good. That was great. There was something else that somebody brought up too, which is like changing the idea of what a painting could be. Exactly. And almost the fact that, you know, you show this to people and one of the first things they say if they're uneducated, um, which is... <laughs> Us. Or, or <laughs> reasonable. <laughs> well, one of the same is that I could do that, right? But or I think that, yeah, that's not art, right? Yeah, like, that's, that's not art. Not. And I think that one of the things that Malovich was also doing was, well, what does it mean to be an artist? Um, why do we have a division of labor? What is the separation about? Shouldn't everybody be able to be an artist? Shouldn't everyone be able to participate in the revolution? So again, there's no political content in this. But the form is deeply political. So and it gets back to that thing you were saying before about the fascist, like, this is what you should think. This it's right. like here, yeah. you know. This totally did not, it, it doesn't allow you to go to that place, right? Yeah. Okay. So that, the fact that we can talk about multiple meanings is inherently like bringing the democracy into it. Man, you are right. a fire Steve. You're a fire Look. Steve. Well, thank you. Okay. What is this? Uh, okay, this is another one of my favorite. This is um, Tatlin's Tower. Um, it was Vladimir Tatlin was commissioned by the Russian government to create a monument to the Third International. It was going to be larger than the Eiffel Tower. Maybe you want to show the next slide, Steve. If we can see it in situ. Larger than the Eiffel Tower. It was going to have revolving cylinders and triang uh, triangles and cubes in it. Um, see that sort of thing running up the side? That's where... Uh, don't, uh, don't give it away. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but in any case, uh, going up the side, you'd have delivery trucks and you'd have motorcycle messengers. Up at the top, they were going to broadcast agitprop films onto the sky right, on cloudy days, so you could actually see propaganda in the sky. There was going to be loudspeakers that would spread the message of the revolution all over St. Petersburg. Um, and as, you know, Steve tipped the hand, go to the next slide. It was never built. <laughs> there wasn't well, enough... A model. Yeah, it was a model, exactly. There was not enough steel in all of Russia to build the thing. It was structurally unsound, right? Um, it was just, it was whack -a doodle right? It was absurd. It was, you know, it just, yeah, impossible. Why couldn't they build it? Well, there wasn't enough steel. It was structurally unsound. The idea yeah, of having, it. what? Come on. It's so well, awesome. <laughs> I know it's awesome. And just think about that, that the Russian government paid to have this built, right? And so, but I think, Steve, you put your finger on it, which is, why couldn't we build it? And the answer is, you can't build it now. But in the future, we can build it. In the nothing's future, too good for the working class. Nothing <laughs> is too good for the working class. Exactly. Is that in the future of the grand socialist world, we will be able to build things like this. That monuments to revolutions won't be dudes on horses, but they'll be wacky, seemingly impossible, structural, sculptural things, right? And, you know, it's really about that idea of pushing the idea of what's possible. All right, it's, so you have, speaking of wacky, yeah. these pictures in here. Why don't you tell them? What oh, they're... yes, okay. This is Varvara Stepanova, who is a, um, a comrade of Vladimir Tatlin um, and Malevich. And uh, she was a designer, she was an artist, 
And one of the things she designed were unisex sports outfits. Um, and as far as I know, they never were made. Um, in fact, the only ones that were made were ones worn by herself. That's Bavara Stepanova on the right. Um, so, Steve, why design unisex sports outfits when you, they're not going to be made? I don't. I just I want them to exist. I want well, this to exist too. I want to run up Tatlin's tower in one of these outfits. And <laughs> exactly. And you know what? In the new socialist republic, you will be able to run up Tatlin's Tower as one of those. And the key here is they are unisex outfits, okay? Because in the future, we are not going to be riven by gender binaries. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, that's, that's the beauty of it, is she is imagining a future, bringing it into being through her art, which doesn't exist now. But yeah. we can ask that question that you asked earlier, Steve, which is, why not? Yeah. What if? Couldn't it be possible? And this is something which our good friend Jacques Ranciere calls the redistribution of the sensible. The redistribution of the sensible. Which maybe that's just a rough tra fresh French translation, but what does that mean? Oh, I thought you were going to answer that. Well, I always understood it as sensible, meaning like the senses, sight, yeah. sound feeling how you understand the world and that it's like well we we use the term recalibration of reality which is what yeah. we're calling this but it's like ha, a, a, an adjustment on how what how you on what you can take in as real exactly exactly and it's really he's playing with this idea of sensibility which is like what we hear of as noise could be politics what we smell and think is disgusting could be beautiful. And that real revolutions happen at that sense level. It's a fundamental, as you said, recalibration of what we take to be reality. But I also think he's playing with that other idea of sensible, like it's sensible. Right? Or it makes sense to me. Or exactly, that makes sense to me, is because he says when revolutions really happen, and this is what avant-garde art can do, and the uh, sort of aesthetic function of political art can do, is it basically redistributes that idea of sensibility and makes other senses make sense. Um, that what seemed to be sensible is now nonsense and what seemed to be nonsense is now sensible. And you think back to revolutions, right? Whether they be the feminist revolution, the queer revolution, revolution for civil rights, it's all of those moments of which what is at stake is transforming how people look at the world. And so people look at women differently. People look at queers and transgender folks differently. People look at people with different religion and ethnicity and so on and so forth differently. And so what seemed to be natural, let's take slavery for example, only 150 years, seems absolutely absurd. And that's when revolutions transform the world. Mm -hmm. So it's not mirroring reality as it is or even mirroring a different perspective on reality. It's fundamentally trying to reorganize the coordinates of how we make sense of reality. All right, so this makes sense for like avant-garde art, but how does this? Yeah. Okay. So th this is the, yeah, it gets a little harder here. Okay. So um, give me the next slide, Steve. So we're gonna go back to civil rights movement for a second, and this is Martin Luther King giving his "I Have a Dream" speech, and that speech, I've been reading it over and over because I'm always astounded at the brilliance of that speech. So the first half of it. What Martin Luther King does is he holds a mirror up to reality. He basically says, these are the problems with America. This is how white supremacy operates. This is the world that we're battling against. And then halfway through, he starts conjuring up these incredible visions. He starts talking about mountains are going to have to be laid low. And that uh, in, he can imagine a time where the sons and daughters of former slave owners will sit down with the sons and daughters of former slaves. And he starts using this often biblical imagery to conjure up this vision of a fundamentally different world. And of course that's the I have a dream part, right? That whole I have a dream is him moving from the mimetic to the aesthetic, moving from what is to this imagination of what could be. The brilliance of Martin Luther King is he knew, he knew that you needed both, okay? 
and we can come back to that at the end. But you need to both critique reality, but you also have to give people an imagination of what can take its place. So um, there's something, when we do our trainings, one of the things we do is we, we've talked about this before, we end with an action that we do with the people we work with. Okay, And sometimes they're mimetic actions. Sometimes they're actions in which what we try to do is reveal the reality that people don't want to see. But sometimes they're aesthetic actions. Yeah, and uh, Borjana in the audience is dedicated to you. <laughs> um, so this is an image of Macedonia. Uh, it's very, you're trying to show nationalism here, Steve, right? Yeah, and well, and the statue. Yeah. So it's hard to get a sense of the scale of that statue, but it's maybe the biggest statue I've ever seen. Um, uh, so Macedonia next to Russia is one of the most hostile places for uh, LGBT people. This is an image from a security camera where a gang of people just ripped, ripped apart a LGBT center. Um, when they have marches, they're, they're, they have been attacked, right? So it's very hostile. But it's also a new country and, and uh, they've done all these, it's, it's bizarre if you ever go there. They're trying to establish like a history and, and the idea that they're a country and what that means. And so their downtown has been transformed in the last 10, 15 years um, with hundreds, hundreds of these statues. So if you look at this picture, every you know 20 feet or 15 feet, there are statues of these historical Macedonians that did great things. Um, and they're trying to kind of, in a way, change the reality or the history. Yeah. Um, so this is the context, right? And so what we did, well, I, I guess one of the things I should say is that when you exist in a space like this uh, and you're an LGBT person or anybody where like most of the country is against you and when you go out in public, they, they tell you to get lost, the, your response, I think it's naturally to be hostile in return and to, to reciprocate the anger. And so when we talked about what we could do as a project, there was, <laughs> there was a bit of hostility at first, right? It's like, let's go out there and show them. Um, but what we did and ended up doing instead was to create the country that we wanted. So Macedonia is part of the former Yugoslavia, and it officially has this name of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, because there's a controversy with the name where Greece still wants to claim Macedonia. So we made a new country called the Future Republic of the Former Republic of Macedonia. And it's in Skopje, which is the, the capital city in their big park. And so this is a picture of it. And up front there, you can see the uh, gateway to enter the country. That uh, says enter, um, and we had our border security. Or John, I think that's you, right? Uh, and then we would give out in her hands. Um, you can see our like uh, it's not a passport, but an ID card, and it was modeled after the former Yugoslav ID card. But we, and we changed the seal of Macedonia to include this heart, and we told everyone it was a country that was based on love, and everyone was welcome as soon as you. Uh, entered, our border security would blow the whistle and like clap and welcome you. Get every, everyone actually would cheer for you when you came in. And then uh, you were welcome to become one of the heroes of the country. So you could write that you were a hero or heroine of, of the country and what you, your name or what you did to become a hero or heroine and then have your picture taken on a podium. Uh, so you would become one of these statues. And uh, it was, oh, and then there were areas in the back left there that, that for conversations, so you could talk to different people. And it was hugely popular. This is like a, it was the biggest thing going in the park that day. These were all these kids that came by. Um, and it was, as far as like an LGBT sort of friendly advocacy kind of event, it felt very open, but it wasn't overtly that. You would come in and hang out and then realize that there were, maybe two women that had their arms around each other or were kissing somewhere, you know? Um, and I was like, oh, okay, well, this is, I guess that's what happens in this country. And it just became what was normal. Um, let's see, what else? I think that, yeah, I like, I just want to dwell on that for a second, Steve, what you just yeah. said, that it became normal. 
And so, it, and it was a better normality than the normal outside of the former Yugoslav Republic of, well, is it <laughs> the future Republic of the former Republic of Yugoslavia? Nope, got that wrong. But you know what I mean. It, yeah. it, it, it created a space and a place which people wanted to be part of and where you could really recalibrate your idea of what normal reality was. It gave enough cues and clues as to what was going on. It looked a lot like Macedonia. We had statues and so on and so forth, but it was also a radically different space and a space that was, you know, to be frank, far more loving and far more fun, and it's why people came. Yeah. And then it, it, even in the border documents, you know, you, your gender was on a quadrant and everything was written in pencil. You could have a different nationality than your ID and you could change it whenever you wanted. Um, so there were a lot of these little details, um, but it really was about creating this inclusive space as an oasis in the park um, that uh, the, our, the people that we were working with there, the sort of administrator types, were trying to keep track of how many people came and we lost track over 600. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the most well-attended uh, event that they had had in years. Now it was it was also probably the least overtly political, um, and so as a long term strategy, just repeating that, you might want to tweak it a little bit. But it definitely worked in creating this other world and shifting what was sent, you know that that recalibrating reality or redistribution of the sensible. So let's go back to Audra Lord here, Steve. Yeah, let's let her, uh, her finish it out again. Why we love this essay by Audre Lorde is that she really talks about like how we can take our dreams and through artistic expression turn them into an idea and then because it's art and it exists in the world communicate that idea to others. And So this whole sort of aesthetic approach in a lot of ways is that communication of a new idea but even the mimetic approach is about communicating a certain way of looking at reality. Um, and so I guess that what we learned from art history um, is that art is incredibly powerful and it doesn't need to be just in museums. It doesn't need to just cater to the vision of the wealthy. It can be used in the powerful. It can be used by the rest of us to reveal reality but also to recalibrate reality. So now we want to take questions from all of you. So feel free if there's more information uh, uh, you want to know or questions you have or comments you want to make, start typing them in now. While we wait for that, we just want to give you a quick lowdown on what's coming next. Um, next week and, and the week after, we have two webinars where we're going to have guests come in. Um, the first one is uh, what we can learn from Hollywood, and it will be with Jason Grote, who is a Hollywood screenwriter. Exactly. He worked on Mad Men and he worked on Smash and uh, we know him because he's a longtime activist as well. He's a street activist. Um, he also and, has, uh, credits as a playwright and yeah. uh, wrote a lot of plays. And then, a uh, playwright, exactly. And so he's going to, you know, it came out of this idea of that if Trump is actually more of a creature of entertainment than a politician, then we need to talk to entertainers to know how we can combat Trump. So the link for that is uh, going out in the chat, and you can uh, register. And then the, the, set, the one the week after is learning from South Africa. Um, and we're going to have two guests, Marlies and Ishtar, from the Sex Worker Education Advocacy Task Force and the Asajiki Coalition to End uh, Criminalization of Sex Work come. Um, and the, there's a few reasons we wanted to invite them. Um, one is we've, we've worked with them quite a bit and they're very skilled but, uh, and, and would have insights just in general but specifically from the context of South Africa uh, because they're, I think they're ahead of us as far as uh, dealing with leaders like Trump. Um, they've, they've got a several year jump on us. Um, so the registration for those uh, are, are in the chat. Um, also, Steve, really quickly, uh, Steve Duncombe is going to be at Bryant University on Thursday if you're near Rhode Island. Yeah. Um, have we got some good questions? What's yeah, we do. 
Yeah. Do you want to just mention what the Open Utopia is? And then we'll oh, yeah. Go. A great book has come out by uh, this woman, Amber Day, called Do-It-Yourself Utopia. Um, and so I have a chapter in there about this utopian project I did called uh, the openutopia.org. You can check out anytime. But there's going to be a whole bunch of folks there talking about their utopian experiments. Um, here it's about uh, 20 minutes outside of Providence. I don't know really where it is. I'm going to find that out Thursday when I get there. But check it out, 3 p.m. should be a good bunch of folks doing lots of interesting things. Um, and we've got some good questions. Um, we got a great question from Lane over here. And this is, this is a big one. How do we move from beautiful symbolic gestures, which we on the left are very good at, to instrumental institutional power, which we are much worse at doing? So the first thing I can think of is uh, it helps to work with organizations that are uh, not as good at the big, beautiful, symbolic gestures, um, but are better at the instrumental, institutional things. Um, and that you know, part of the premise that I think Steve and I have been working with for a lot of years is that these things work better when they're in working in combination. Um, and that that push and pull and, and the instincts of the institution that you'd be working with versus yours um, play out pretty well. That would That's a quick answer. Steve, do you have other thoughts on that? Yeah, the only thought I'd have is that um, kind of to flip the question as well, which is those organizations and those parts of us which are really good at working towards yeah. instrumental and institutional power need to know what we're working towards. Um, one, so we can envision it, this goes back to Audre Lorde, but also so it, because it motivates us. Um, it becomes a little bit of the, the, the grain of utopia which keeps us going and gives us a point on the horizon to work towards. So let's see if we have any other questions. You can go ahead and type them in while we're waiting for um, any others quickly. Um, Leslie, had, Leslie had a good one here, which is, yeah. Did you have any negative reactions from the government? I think she's thinking about Macedonia. Oh, yeah. um, and actually, no, no, we didn't. Um, and part we of the, for it, and we had like <laughs> we were ready to flee. <laughs> True. We kicked out of the country and never returned. Right. But, we had, we also did a similar utopian thing um, in Russia, and that's really when we thought we were going to get uh, cracked down on. Um, and I think that we didn't. Partly because this idea of redistributing the, uh, the sensible and recalibrating reality was that the authorities didn't quite understand what we were doing. That is, is, they couldn't make sense of it within the old framework of politics. Politics is about marches. Politics is about chants. Politics is about someone handing out pamphlets that look like pamphlets. So what happens when you have a space which is about welcoming people into a republic of love and the political pamphlets that we're handing out are actually look like ID cards. Um, they just couldn't make sense of it, right? And so the, the very thing that kept them from making sense of it was actually its power insofar as we were trying to create a different sensibility. Yeah. So a couple things. Um, if there's any other questions, uh, just type them in. Um, but one is that these are free partly because of the donations that you all have made in the past. Um, if you, uh, you'll get a little link to the, to where to donate. Um, the, the best way is like a, a, a sustainer thing. So whatever amount you can give, but just to make it, uh, regular so we don't have to hunt, chase you down. Um, you know, make the good decision once and then, uh, don't think about it again. But, uh, those, those, um, donations really help, uh, help keep these free. The other thing is, uh, after these next two, we're going to go to monthly, and we're going to try to respond to uh, prompts. So if you have something you would like for us to cover, or you'd like for us to talk about, um, please get in touch through the contact page on our site and let us know, and we'll we'll put it in the in the list. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Uh, Leslie wants to know: Was Picasso's work effective at the time? Well. Actually, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> it's just something I found out with a little research. It was not the most successful thing in the Spanish uh, pavilion um, uh, when it was shown. Um, it became very powerful. 
um, afterwards, um, partly because, and someone had written this up before, um, that Picasso was known as an artist, and so Picasso putting his name to the cause actually helped things quite a bit and legitimized the cause of the revolution. Um, it also became very, very effective later on, so much to the point of that when Colin Powell was making the case for the invasion of Iraq um, at the UN, they had to cover over the tapestry version of it there um, because they didn't want any visuals that would show the horrors of war next to a person making a case for war. Um, so I think that, you know, and the, and the other thing to think about with this is we have to think about the effect of this aesthetic approach differently than the effect of the mirror approach. We can tell when the mirror is effective when people start talking about what happened during the Vietnam War, um, what happened in Birmingham, Alabama, but it's this whole recalibration of reality, redistribution of sensible, it takes a long time. And by the time we're there, we don't even know we're there because it's normal. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, I think we're at time. Yeah. Um, Thank so you for thanks. joining us and, and uh, taking the time today. It's, and and I, I love seeing the familiar names. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. And um, please come back. Please tell your friends. Please. Uh, Spread this far and wide as you can. Um, and oh, and they're all, all the old ones are archived online, too. So if you missed some in the past, uh, they're, they're on our site for now. We keep saying for now because we don't know how long. <laughs> maybe forever, maybe not. We don't know. So, <laughs> uh, Most of all, keep on doing what you're doing, being creative, going out there, kicking some butt, uh, reflecting on the world as it is, and imagining a better world. Yeah. All right. Till next time. See ya. <laughs>